Welcome back. This is Emily Seal here from Motlow College. Today we'll be discussing the director. The director. So today we'll um, kind of talk in terms of movie directors, since that's something that you're probably more familiar with than a stage director. Uh, so your discussion question this week is to tell me who your favorite director is. And what I found in my in uh, class discussions is often people don't know who their favorite directors are until they start looking at the um, their favorite movies and then they start to see a theme. Okay, I, I really like all these really goofy movies. Oh, I'm a big fan of writer-director Mel Brooks. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, oh, I like all these romantic comedies. Oh, I didn't know that I was a big fan of writer-director Nora Ephron. Uh, so there are some that kind of automatically jump to our mind. Um, you know, Steven Spielberg is obviously one of the big directors of our day. Um, but then there are others that um, you may not even know has consistently directed some of your favorite uh, movies, maybe like Judd Apatow. You may not realize that he directed and produced maybe a lot of the similar movies. But if your favorite director is just the person who directed your favorite movie and you don't like any of the rest of his or her work, they're still a good director because they directed one hit. So um, if you will get to the discussion board and tell me who your favorite director is and why. Um, so a director is kind of hard to pin down. This is not a director. Uh, this is Bear Bryant. And uh, because a director is a lot like a coach. And a good coach um, has sort of isms that they say. My father played for Bear in the late 60s. And uh, he only played for one year before his knees got knocked out. But um, he... Uh, had a huge impact on my father as a life coach and as a mentor. And so he would um, he would say these things to me, you know, as a six-year-old, like agile, mobile, and hostile. Uh, it's a, not a good thing to encourage your six-year-old to be. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he had other isms from his days at Alabama, um, you know, ways to eat, uh, ways to exercise that really stuck with him for years and years and uh, inspired him. And a big part of being a director is not only, you know, giving the plays, I need you to enter from stage left and exit stage right, it's also motivating people, which is what a good coach does. Uh, once again, if you didn't know, if you didn't have on that bright hat in the on the field, you may not know that a director was even at work because they're not on the field playing. In most cases, unless it's a director actor like Mel Brooks, uh, uh, sorry, Mel Gibson. Oh, Mel Brooks is an actor director as well. Um, often, you're not going to see them and see their face. They are invisible to the naked eye. So, um, much like a coach, they're on the sidelines. They're not in the action or in the game in most cases. Um, so, taking a jaunt into theater history, um, being a director is also like being a teacher. So now that I'm a professor at Motlow College, I am a director. I was a director at Hattiesburg High as well and before, but um, my regular job at Motlow College is to be a director. And uh, traditionally, the director was just called teacher. Uh, in ancient Greece and in the medieval times, they would refer to the director as the teacher. And um, in some cases, they were the teacher, but in other cases, um, you know, like in a school setting, as what I mean by they were the teacher. Um, and so that word was sort of interchangeable. The concept of a director um, is fairly new though. Uh, it was usually like in Shakespeare's time we have evidence that it was the stakeholders, the largest, the people who put the most money into the theater, they were the ones that lead actor or lead actress who got paid the most would then put the most money into the theater and they would be the one to coach other people. Um, but as a result, in Shakespeare's time, it was very much Hamlet in the front giving his soliloquy and then a hired hand, someone in the back, just standing there, um, you know, filling the stage. They didn't have as much um, stage business. They weren't able to create ensembles. It was a star mentality um, because 
directing and coaching a crowd scene actually takes quite a bit of work. And so it was very much um, presentationalism, uh, you know, Hamlet coming to the edge of the stage and delivering his soliloquy um, while the hired help stands in the background. So um, I would say that not having directors at that time probably hindered the performances. Uh, so, so many things you hear me say, Stanislavski, Stanislavski, Stanislavski. Uh, well, here I go again on that um, repeat button. I feel like this class is like Shakespeare, Stanislavski, the Greeks, Shakespeare, Stanislavski, the Greeks. Um, but they're, they're just major figures who are undeniably have had a huge impact on the theater. And during Stanislavski's time, um, he wasn't actually the very first one, um, but during that age of enlightenment, uh, people sat down and used the theater, uh, they used that theater seat as a scientific time to sort of observe reality as Aristotle intended it, and then learn from it. Um, and so during that, you know, 18th, um, 19th century, sort of enlightenment boom, um, the director became more important because we were started dressing people in historical garb. We started um, stylizing and um, that 18th and 19th century rationalism sort of gave rise to the modern day director because all of that attention to detail became more necessary. Um, and that's, that style is called realism, the style that Stanislavski liked, the style of making things true to life. Every little detail uh, on the stage, it helps you to immerse yourself into the story, to suspend your disbelief, um, because you're seeing things acted out as they would. Um, and as we talked about last class, the um, design is also sort of, you know, um, often... Uh, started by what kind of what the director says. If the director says we're going to do this realistically, um, then like we said, Joe Turner is come and gone. We're going to have an actual sink on stage. We're going to make the biscuits. The, the actors are going to be eating the biscuits on stage because that's the most naturalistic way to stage that. Stanislavski hated melodrama. He hated this overacting, this dun da da da, I'm the good guy, Mwahaha, I am the bad guy. Uh, you know, Stanislavski despised that sort of simplicity that he didn't think was true to life. And of course, the realists, the enlightened age, they uh, would watch a melodrama like that and say, okay, that's not true. Most people aren't 100% good and 100% bad. Uh, although I've met a villain or two in my age. Uh, this is a sort of extremes and it's not true to life. So um, if you are a realist, you may be a fan of a realistic theater. Maybe when you go to see a play, you may want to seek out one of those uh, realist authors like Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams. Um, we'll talk about that more in our modern theater chapter. But uh, if you are a realist, you may like and seek out a realistic play because sometimes you can learn something from observing as we saw in the acting section um, in the interviews with John Lithgow and he talks about how we're learning about the war and the nature of war for profit as we watch All My Sons. Um, so, so it still goes on today that people learn something when they go to the theater. And so but this, this realism um, really gave rise to director because it's much more complicated to to sort of um, get everybody costumed according to the period to um, oversee you know the rise of sets like I said sets were not as big of a deal um, before this 18th 19th century enlightenment boom so with all of that came um, a new attention to detail that a director really needed to be at the helm of that ship <laughs> so if for some reason someone comes to you um, on the street and says, who is the first modern day director? <laughs> this is the correct answer. It is George II, the Duke of Saxe-Meiningen. And he um, was the first one to create an ensemble to take plays that um, included everybody. He was wealthy and so he was able to fund a sort of um, intricate costumes and even <laughs> there's talk of a, a horse on stage is interesting um, 
but, but Duke of Saxe Meiningen is considered the first modern day director. Um, Chekhov and Stanislavski had access to his work, which influenced them. So he gets the credit for being the very first, um, albeit he didn't have um, much further success. Um, so <laughs> there you can see the Juba uh, as the Joe Turners come and gone as they're stomping around the table there uh, in singing and uh, it is as realistic as possible. Now some people may say that there are elements of anti-realism to it such as the spiritual elements that come into the play, um, you know, the seizures and um, I would I would say it's still predominantly realism. So that's me. Um, so when we, uh, when you started the module, hopefully you've watched Julie Taymor's TED Talk. If you haven't already, um, please go do that now. It should be the first link in your online, um, what's the word, uh, in your uh, module. There it goes. So I fell in love with Julie Taymor when I watched The Lion King. Uh, I grew up watching the Disney movie, and um, I s may have already told you this, I think, in the first lecture, that when I sat down in the seat of The Lion King, I was really very skeptical. I thought, this is going to be some cartoony, commercial nonsense that's not for um, someone as sophisticated as I, uh, right? Um, and then within the first five minutes of the play, I was weeping. It was just a beautiful representation of natural order of things, of these animals and the way that people use their bodies and the puppets to sort of animate. Um, it was so, uh, I had recently come back from China and it was so influenced um, by a different culture. Uh, she talks about in her um, in her TED talk, the different studies abroad that she had done and how that influenced her work. And um, I know when I ever I go abroad, I, I kind of get into sponge mode. And when I travel, I see these things and I think, how can I put that on the stage and help someone have this experience out of the regular, ordinary American life that they lead? And I think uh, Julie Taymor does a great job of incorporating um, long-standing theatrical history from other countries such as masks and puppets. So you heard her speak about her international experience and how that informed her aesthetic. Obviously you can see the seashells there on the um, corset. You can see the use of animal um, fur and her masks and they look very uh, you know, they don't look American, we'll say it that way. They look very African. Uh, and if you watch her other movies, which um, they are all rated R, just as a kind of side note, but um, kind of warning there. Uh, if you watch all of her other movies, they are going to have elements um, from other cultures. She almost always has that multicultural feel. Another thing you may have heard Julie Taymor hint at that she didn't really fully flush out uh, is her sort of um, falling out with Spider-Man uh, Turn Off the Dark. So here's just some of the details. Um, she was the director. She wrote uh, helped write the script. She brought on a lot of her creative team and people she'd worked with before. Now one of the big names that she was able to get uh, was from U2. She got both Bono and The Edge to uh, do the music. Now she had made that contact when she did Across the Universe and so she, her bringing in those big names was a big part of their success. Um, and so obviously she worked heavily with Marvel in order to do the Spider-Man adaptation. Um, but according to some New York Times articles that I've read um, then, and I kind of brushed up before I looked at this, uh, before I taught it again, um, she spent $75 million before the show even opened. It's one of the highest... Uh, I think it is the most that's ever been spent on a Broadway show before it opens, $75 million. Uh, it cost a million dollars to keep it running each week, to pay the cast and to up 
uh, maintain uh, what they're doing. It ran for about three years on Broadway, and um, from what I understand, it's breaking even that way. Um, but, uh, like I said, she was fired right before the show opened. Um, she's known to be a little bit controlling and not as willing to compromise, especially when it comes to quality. She has a clear vision, and she wants that vision to be um, carried out. Uh, they did, uh, she did sue for the copyright uh, because obviously it was her creation and we talked about that in chapter three and when we talked about playwriting uh, when it's her creation she's entitled to um, the profits uh, the future profits uh, which we're talking millions of dollars obviously um, uh, they did settle and um, now Marvel owns the exclusive rights and the producers of the show own the exclusive rights so they can now uh, change the script, uh, cut the script, uh, change the music, anything that they want to do. So if you go and see um, Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark in say Las Vegas is where it's rumored to open, it may not be the exact same show that was running on Broadway uh, because uh, Julie Taymor no longer has the control that she had over it. Um, so it's it's likely the nature of a show in Las Vegas is, is usually different from one in, in New York. It's, it's going to be more entertainment driven. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, more glitzy, more glamour. It's just a different kind of environment. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if it does open in Las Vegas, if it kind of mimics the um, Cirque du Soleil kind of feel, uh, because that is what's really popular in Las Vegas right now. So when she was talking about being in the in the crucible and uh, on the edge, uh, you know, following the line, all of that, uh, she was talking about that experience of getting fired from Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Um, and, you know, for some of you, it may kind of shock you to know that millions are being made or spent. Um, but I just want to remind you all of that that we studied last class the artisans, the specialists, every person getting a paycheck on Broadway. Um, it, it is a people-run endeavor. So that's something that you can feel good about when you go and spend your money at a place like um, Vaughn Bronsevic Center or the Tennessee Performing Arts Center or even your local community theater. Um, most of that money is is very conscientiously spent, uh, especially on the community theater level. We've got to, got to be very careful with all our pennies, but it's also paying people to do what they love and paying uh, true artists, true artisans to do. I mean, just look at that um, hand beaded, those hand beaded corsets that they're wearing. I mean, I can't even imagine how many hours of physical labor that was and how beautiful um, that piece of art is. So, uh, Julie Taymor tangled web um but but anti-realism uh, is obviously anything fantastical anything that's um not realistic and we'll get into some of the isms when we uh talk about modern theater uh you know absurdism abstractism i mean there's all kinds of isms going on um some famous um, anti-realists some were uh meyerhold who had a special uh, interest in gesture and the way that bodies move acrobatics um, and uh, you know there's there's it's just innumerable all the different directing styles and I, I only have so much that I can test you over so <laughs> we'll move on I really liked this turn of phrase on page 154 that Anti-realism can be a simultaneity of sensory expressions, uh, impressions, and that to me encapsulated why I cried at The Lion King in the first five minutes. It's such a beautiful music, the orchestration, but the artistry and the skill of using the puppets, uh, it really was just um, 
it was a feast for the eyes and for the ears. Uh, you know, there's something to be said for the sensual experience, and I don't mean that in a sexual way, uh, but the sensual experience of going to the theater and experiencing things firsthand. It's more engaging. Um, that's why I really encourage you, if you have children, to take them to the theater because, you know, children can sit in front of a television and, and they can learn something, but if you're taking them to a play, all of their senses are engaged uh, and, and it really is just a full body experience uh, so it's really um, unique in that way and different from just going to take them to the movie theater so we compared um, a director to a coach to a teacher but also like a captain of a ship um, and you know some as Julie Taymor discovered, sometimes you are the absolute authority. You are the captain of your ship. Uh, you discipline. Uh, let's see. The until discipline is understood in the theater to be willing and reliant obedience to the manager or captain, no supreme achievement can be accomplished. Uh, and that is, as you can see, sometimes that can backfire. Uh, you know, Julie Taymor is a my way or the highway kind of person, and um, she obviously uh, got the highway. Uh, I think that most of the good directors that I've worked with are very good at compromise. They listen to your feedback, and they may deny you, but they, you know, if you're in a rehearsal, for example, and I'm an actor and I say I think my character walks with the limp and then a good director might say okay let's try that in rehearsal today and then at the end of the rehearsal the director may say you know what I didn't buy the limp it didn't work for me and let me tell you why um, but having those long conversations and um, clarifying not just being dismissive and draconian uh, which is what some directors are some directors uh, I've actually heard a director call an actor a meat puppet which means <laughs> it's just uh, you know, doing what you tell them to do. So it's, it's both an artist and uh, a technical thing. So one of your first jobs as a director is to get funded and to find producers who are willing to back you. Uh, there was a movie um, there with Nathan Lane, Matthew Broderick, and Uma Thurman uh, kind of making fun of what a producer does. Nowadays, there are thousands of producers. Um, any given project at the Tonys, uh, you can see they go on stage, how many producers, like 20 producers produced the producers. It wasn't just um, one one guy, what used to be one person would back a show, but like I said, we're dealing with millions of dollars now. So the fundraising and money management of that is much larger than it used to be. For me as a director at Motlow College, my producer is the University of Motlow College, so I have to always be mindful. Um, is this going to be in some way educational? Is this appropriate for college age students? And I have to please my producer. Now you think about how many government theaters there are in America, how many theaters rely on um, some level of uh, grant or um, some kind of government support, whether it be from the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, sorry, uh, then in some ways we're not going to have a lot of controversial theater in a community theater because they're getting grants from the government, so they're not going to stand up to the government necessarily. So uh, he who pays the piper names the tune, as they say. So um, where's the money coming from? A producer, uh, if once a director finds a producer, in some cases the director and the producer are the same person, uh, the producer is pretty much most of the things that have to do with a budget. And I will say that the theater producer is different um, from like a, a musical producer. That's a whole different, but not to be confused. Um, the producer often acquires the facility that the, th the theater will actually be performed in, the final production, and also the uh, facility that the rehearsal space. Those aren't always the exact same thing. Um, often, a especially if you're on like Broadway or some high level venue, they're going to have a different rehearsal space because they can only afford to rent that space, you know, for a very short period of time. It's very expensive. So the producers in charge of maintaining and acquiring the facilities. Uh, producers sometimes select the play, not always. So there's a good chance that um, because Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark was partially written by um, 
oh, we were just Julie Taymor. Uh, there's a good chance that she probably brought her play that she wanted to do to a producer. But sometimes it goes the other way around. Sometimes a producer knows the audience, uh, knows what'll sell, for example, and they're the ones who are um, selecting the play. Sometimes the producer casts the play. Usually a director or a casting director will cast the play, but sometimes a producer can cast the play. And sometimes the producer hires um, the design crew. That's always going to be a negotiation between the producer and the director. So, uh, But anything producer, I want you to think money. That's usually anything to do with the money is going to be handled by the producer. So this is a play that we did at Motlow College called Carrie's War. Uh, Carrie's War was set in the um, Second World War, and it's about the Blitz when um, the Nazis were bombing on London, and all of the uh, children, a lot of the children, were sent out of the city to go stay with relatives, or in many cases, strangers. Um, and so this particular um, novel of Carrie's War, the children uh, were actually sent to Wales. And so it's a very different way of life. Um, Wales is a more rustic community, whereas London, of course, is more metropolitan. So when I was in this play at Motlow College, it was my first year, and Jeannie Gallant directed it for us. And she does, or did at that time, she no longer does, the study abroad in London. And she was very interested in telling the story of the Blitz to Americans because um, she hadn't heard it much represented. And so as a director, you choose the play according to your own interests, of course. And then also, like I said, our producers are an educational field. Um, and those are student actors there. A girl is actually playing a boy in the in the Newsies cap there. And then Olivia, who I showed you a picture of running the board last class, now she is playing Carrie, uh, the title role in Carrie's War. Well, that's Jeannie in the bottom left-hand corner there, and that is her British friend uh, who had, who lived in England during the Blitz and who came to see our production and kind of informed us as actors of what it was like during that time to be separated from your parents. As I said, she was interested in the Second World War, and she also knew that her audience was interested in the Second World War. Uh, this was at the same time that the movie Captain America came out, and there was a lot of, uh, there's always, regardless of whatever's in the box office, uh, you know, World War II, there's quite a few history buffs who really like, because it was, it was a very influential war. So many people are curious about um, what it's what's going on. Is it producible? This is something um, you know with your limited means, whether it be budget or people. So let's talk a little bit about that. Did we have a carry for Carrie's War? Well, we did. We had Olivia. She grew up in community theater. She was well studied. She was serious about wanting to learn and carry the show. <laughs> That's a pun. <laughs> carry. She carried the show. Yeah. Oh well. Um, she was capable of doing the role. I would never think to do Man of La Mancha or King Lear without having an older seasoned professional actor who could handle memorizing those lines and carrying the show. Um, you know, some directors will say, if you build it, they will come, and they just, you know, announce the season and hope for the best. But many um, directors want to know they have at least a few actors on the line who can pull off the show, especially especially at a small uh, community theater or a small um, community college like Motlow. We, you know, we don't have a lot of students who are interested in being in the place, so we have to make sure that we have the capability uh, before we announce the season. Ha, huh, there's me. I played an old lady. <laughs> Uh, you can see the makeup that I drew old age on my face there. And I was the costumer for this show. Uh, it's one of my loves is pretty dresses such as that one. But that dress we actually had to rent because um, I already had another dress built. And it, the script was very specific about that dress. It had to be a gray dress with pink feathers of all things. <laughs> so I had to design it and get it built. Um, but in general, most of the show was... Um, um, pedestrian clothes that we could just go buy a suit off the rack to fit an actor and many of the clothes were com 
came from the Goodwill uh, in order to save money. So, um, and then we could spend more money on things like big dresses that are referred to in the script. Um, so concept. A concept is a director's um, primary job is to sit down with the script and come up with his or her interpretation of the script. This is something that Julie Taymor talked about uh, with her ideograph and how do you boil down the story uh, and create a course concept. In your book, they talk about a poster. How do you imagine that a poster um, for the production would look like. What colors do you see? What tone do you see? And um, for some directors, I know for Jeannie, a big part of um, her angle on it was the children. So we really wanted to play up what would it be like to be a child in this era and to live through this. Um, and, and so that was you know, visually on the poster, that was something we, we went for. And um, and uh, a good director, like it says there, can either confirm or challenge your existing ideologies. And a good director knows their audience and what their audience can handle. I recently went to Cumberland County Playhouse in Crossville, Tennessee. And uh, they are a pretty run-of-the-mill um repertory theater they they do musicals they do they have a small space a, but a very good uh quality i've never seen a show there that wasn't absolutely wonderful and uh they do a lot of box office hits that are sure to um please like sound of music and the music man but the day that i was there um it was a matinee performance and one of the kind of secrets of Cumberland County Playhouse is that they bus in the elderly and um, you know a lot of people retire in Tennessee and there's uh, church groups for example and the show that I saw on that matinee afternoon uh, was about an Episcopal priest who lost his faith and his wife actually started writing his sermons for him. And um, even though that may, may not sound very controversial to your ears, uh, when I was sitting in that audience I could feel the tension. I could see people shifting in their seats and that it sort of um, struck a nerve with them. You know, what is it appropriate for a uh, a woman to be a preacher is kind of one question of that. Another question of that is, do people lose their faith or can you lose your faith? Um, and so it was really deep spiritual play that sort of um, was asking the audience to think. And uh, it was written by a local Tennessean and it was a really interesting play. So even um, I think that was very well produced because they knew their audience, they knew how to challenge them to a certain extent, but it wasn't grotesquely challenging to their ideology or their ideas. It just gave them um, something to think about. Um, so after you've found your producer and you've picked your play and you've kind of getting to know and thinking about your audience, as a director you need to pick your designers. Pick your designers. Now on the left I have Kurt Krauss. He's a very talented um, jack-of-all-trades really but he designs our sets he has experience with um, electrics so he can wire things up for us he is a local artist and he's a wonderful painter all of those backdrops that I showed you from the Wizard of Oz were done by Kurt and um, so she started meet, meeting with Kurt very early on to kind of discuss especially for Carrie's War because they had to have two staircases on our tiny stage so they had to start problem solving um, early on and she knew that Kurt could handle a challenge I don't think she would have done that play if she had known uh, if she didn't know that she had uh, someone who was a skilled woodworker on hand um, on the right there, I have a student because a lot of the designs and a lot of the ideas, especially for props and lights, came out of the students. Um, and uh, this one student who worked on this recently graduated with a design degree. So it definitely um, can spark people into a vocation. Uh, yes, that is a skull she is holding there. She's about to throw it into the lake. Plop! Uh, 
It's a cool play. It's kind of very um, hints of Celtic uh, witchcraft and things. It's, it's really kind of bizarre. Um, so another good thing that a director does after they um, select their technical staff and start technical meetings is then they of course cast their actors. Cast their actors. So there's three types of casting I want you to be familiar with. There's type casting, which is casting someone, um, this is the most common way, but someone based on their own personality or their own uh, look, the way they look. Um, if you look at someone like, um, oh, most people in Hollywood are <laughs> typecast, uh, Mel Gibson, you know, he is a athletic, um, leading man with a lovable sensibility. Uh, he's played generally the same kind of character over and over again. Um, you know, if you see Rachel McAdams in a love story, she she's going to have a lot of the same characteristics of her own personality coming through. That's called typecasting, and most film is typecast. Uh, there's non-traditional casting, such as gender bending. So when um, Julie Taymor talked about casting Helen Mirren in The Tempest as the title role of Prospera rather than Prospero, um, that was gender bending. That was non-traditional casting and I think a um, pretty ingenious one at that. And then there's colorblind casting. So if you go to see a live theater production and um, the mom is white, the dad is white, and the kid is black, uh, there may be um, the director is just using colorblind casting because that black actor was the best person for the part. And if they, um, if directors always had to pay attention to race in terms of casting, then it would limit minority casting. So, of course, some of these plays don't allow for colorblind casting in good taste. I would never uh, do an all-white version of Joe Turner's Come and Gone <laughs> because it's a play about the African-American experience. But if I'm doing a great um, play, you know, like um, Christmas Carol, by Charles Dickens, there's n probably not going to be a lot of roles for African Americans specifically, but I might cast um, a black person in any role or an Asian person in any role, and that would be called colorblind because the audience doesn't need to pay attention to whether or not it is historically accurate for an Asian person to be in London at the turn of the century, it's more uh, just making sure that all people have a chance at any role. So colorblind casting, non-traditional casting, and typecasting. So the rehearsal process, as we're on page 173, let me turn over here. Um, so once the actors are cast, then they meet usually either daily or in this case two or three times a week for the class. We meet during class. Uh, we have rehearsal furniture. You can see that uh, folding chairs there. Those were not on stage when we actually had the show. The rehearsal furniture is just kind of a holding place until the real furniture is rented or brought in, borrowed, or whatever the case may be. Um, Rehearsals uh, are often kind of the drudge work of theater, just getting the lines memorized, memorizing where to be. We'll talk about that in just a minute. You're blocking. Um, and it's definitely a hopeful time where the cast and crew have all of their hopes pinned on the director. Uh, you know, we're all hoping that this is going to be a good sh show, and that's kind of the gamble, especially on something like Broadway, where there's a lot of money involved, you know, $75 million sometimes money, is that you can work on a show for six months, um, you know, have invited audiences for another month, and then only run on Broadway for a week. If it flops, then the producers may pull the money and close the show. So it's a very, um, you know, hopeful time where the cast is has their own set of fears and concerns, uh, and the director has to be the confident one. They have to be the one to instill hope and vision into their cast. 
So blocking is not the activity of hitting people with blocks. Blocking is uh, a um, the way that you move on stage. The basic architecture of your staging is what um, the the textbook says there on 174 entrances, X's, rises, crosses, embraces, any kind of major movement for an actor. So the typical conversation for a director would say, I want you to enter from stage left, cross to center stage. I want you to sit at this line. Uh, then on the next page, you can rise, shake hands, and exit back out the way you came. That would be an example of a blocking conversation as we stage. Um, directors are usually intentional about creating stage pictures and that is how the two bodies relate to them each other. If you look at um, if you're walking down the hall and you see a girl leaned up against the wall and a guy is leaning over her talking and they're standing close to each other. Well in theater we call that um, well, I won't say what we call it, but if you're really close to someone, there's a good chance that you're either um, ready to fight them or to kiss them, right? People don't usually break into that proximity, a certain closeness to each other, unless there's an intimacy there or unless there's an aggression. So if you are creating stage pictures, this can be something kind of awkward for beginning actors. If you're supposed to be playing someone's mother, um, then you're probably going to touch them or stand closer to them, even though that person as an actor may be a stranger to you. So it's the director's job to create those stage pictures. What, how do lovers stand when they stand close to each other? How does the mother stand next to her child or sit? Uh, so creating those sort of communications. This can also be a sense of dominance, right? If you have a king, the throne room is probably going to be set up in some way to show that king's authority, whether he is exalted and sitting on a couple different pedestals or um, uh, if he's, you know, sitting on a high up throne, uh, you know, are people going to turn their back to him? It just matters kind of what the culture is that you're dealing with. You can make someone look more important by giving them an entourage, by giving them a group of people to stand behind them that can make them seem more important or more exalted, which is perhaps still why we have bridal parties on the day of the wedding. Um, so we are going to create an, a pleasing stage picture. Obviously, some of these are more naturalistic plays and they have to happen organically. But if you're doing musical theater, right, at the end of that musical number, you can just strike a pose and everybody is arranged, very contrived arrangement with jazz hands. And that's the stage picture. Focus. We talked about this when we talked about lighting. Where are you supposed to look at any given moment? We want the director's job is to help the person who is supposed to be the center of the action and help prevent upstaging. Now, upstaging is just going to happen sometimes. There's no doubt about it. But we want to try to help people understand the story. And so the carrier of the action, usually the protagonist, uh, needs to be the center of attention. And the extras or the chorus uh, need to reserve some level of anonymity. So this may be a critique that you have if you watch a community production you know so and so was stealing focus when I was supposed to be paying attention to the story the little kid was picking her nose and I got distracted right um, so where was the focus if the focus wasn't on the story or wasn't helping tell the story at any given time then the director may have um, not been doing their job spatial composition like I said how close or far away are you and this is the biggie. This is the big, big one. And that is pacing. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. Um, it's on page 177. Usually, if a critic um, doesn't mention the pace, it's surprising because most people have a pace that they enjoy. Um, if it's not rehearsed long enough, it may be too slow. And that's often the critique of like, let's say a um, 
classical piece like a Shakespeare piece it may be too slow the action's not coming quickly enough especially in our modern day senses of sitcoms and um, you know 24 these action shows it's really people expect a lively pace and for the action to keep going and that's why as they talk about early on in the chapter many directors are often the arranger they'll arrange a piece so most people you know are not going to do the full production of Hamlet they're going to cut some scenes and cut some lines and cut the fat off of it and make it a leaner quicker uh, show to watch I recently went to go see A Doll's House at MTSU. It was a wonderful production, um, partially because they had cut down a lot of the fat, and it was only a two-hour production of Doll's House, which was, um, you know, rare. It's, it's supposed to be kind of a longer show. So the director needs to think, is the audience going to get bored at this point? Do I maybe need to cut this song down to only um, one refrain, right? Uh, is where are the slow parts and how can we make them uh, more engaging? That also has to do with cueing, right? Where is the dead time? Is there dead air? Are people waiting for the next thing to happen? That um, can be hard for an audience and they can get impatient. So a lot of, we're on the bottom of page 175, the more skilled direction, such as, um, you know, fight combat, sometimes takes a specialist. So I'm certified to fight and several different weapons. I'm set of certified by the um, Stage Combatant Association, right? So I can wield a... Um, a quarter staff. If you've ever seen Robin Hood, when uh, they're fighting on the bridge, there they're fighting with quarter staffs, um, which is basically just a big long stick. Uh, Broadsword. I'm also certified in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so I could go in and coach an equity actor, um, you know, based on my qualifications, because it does take a certain level of knowledge. You have to have some training to understand how to pretend to fight. Believe it or not. <laughs> It does take quite a bit of skill to pretend to fight. I definitely would not want to fight you in real life, but I could pretend to fight you all day long. Um, there's also a choreography. You know, obviously, some of these 1950s numbers have prolonged ballet. Uh, if you look at something like Oklahoma, there's a big, long ballet sequence in the middle of that. And... Uh, you know, I've had some studio dance training, um, but I might not presume to choreograph a ballet sequence. So it matters um, who the director is and kind of what their resources are. Sometimes they'll hire out specialists, such as choreographers or fight directors or um, flying specialists if they have some technology. This was a quick fight. Uh, a guy portraying you can see in the middle there Jim is portraying a person with a disability and uh, the guy on the left was a bully and he pushes him down and steals the rake and even though this may look a little bit chaotic it actually was hours of making sure that the rake wasn't gonna hurt anybody because you essentially got a, a weapon there um, something that's basically a quarter staff with pointy stuff on the end of it right you gotta be very very careful uh, to make sure that that doesn't scrape anybody's cornea so when you walk away from a play that has a dance or a duel there's a good chance that you're gonna pay special attention to what was going on in that sequence and um, a lot of the time you know people walk away and say that gun was sounded so bad or that fight wasn't realistic enough or they sure messed up that dance sequence or people walk away and say wow did you see how they fought with those swords or did you see uh, that dance number it was just special so uh, you can pay special attention and that's a fair critique was the uh, the dancing and the dueling was it well well executed because it takes more rehearsal time to sort of iron that out and it takes more skill in many cases. Stage business refers to the small scale movements a character performs within a larger pattern of entrances, crosses, and exits. So they're sitting around a table. Maybe they take tea. Maybe they eat a cookie. Um, you can see she has those tea glasses, those teacups in her hand. Um, believe it or not, executing that little bit of stage business, having tea, uh, it takes quite a bit of 
um, rehearsal on the part of the director because you don't want for example Jim's telling a story there you don't want her reaching over in front to hand the tea at the wrong moment it uh, could interrupt so stage business is often um, take some skill, take some rehearsal just to make sure that it's not too distracting in any given moment. Uh, it can be comically um, uh, unrealistic. You know, that's one of the big critiques of CSI is how someone keeps unloading boxes while they're talking about a gruesome murder, you know, but unloading boxes is a nice little bit of stage business uh, that they can do and that in that sitcom sequence so uh, any kind of thing that they're doing you know maybe they're reading a book or knitting with their hands or taking tea or eating lunch those would all be examples of just a petty stage business that uh, makes the scene seem more realistic rather than just sitting around talking because we're usually multitasking we usually have more than one thing going on at any given time one of the major goals of a director is to coach actors. No matter what your background is as a director, you need to understand the basic fundamentals of acting uh, because you're primarily day-to-day -day dealing with actors and you need to know how to talk to them. Um, you need to be able to explain to them the history of the production. You need to be well researched if you don't have a dramaturg uh, in order to sort of coach them through being um, historically accurate if that's what you're going for. Um, you know, giving people the blocking, telling them their entrances and exits, that's also kind of one of the fundamental things that they do. But coaching the actors in believability you know, saying, uh, I need more intensity from this you in this moment. Could you raise your voice? Could you work up some more emotion in this moment? Those are the sort of conversations you might hear a director having with their actor. Sometimes they stop the run. Some directors talk over the run. Many directors wait until the end of the run and give notes. That's what this is right now. Everybody's sitting on the edge of the stage as Jeannie there in the blue, in the far right, she gives notes that she she's taken throughout the production so the cast to a certain extent needs to trust the director and be willing to accept the authority of the director uh, you know maybe they think that it should be more subtle but if the director says I need more intensity from you I need more emotion then it's the actor's job to please the director and so um, there's once again a relationship of trust just like you have with any sort of athletic coach all right, as I was saying, a well-paced show and a well-directed show. And I didn't mention it. I had it written there, but louder, faster, funnier. There's kind of a joke in vaudeville that that's what every director is just going to tell you to be louder, to, to go faster, and to be funnier. You know, um, But a pace is a delicate thing. You know, because you don't want to rush the actors. If the rush, if the actors are just saying the words as fast as they can and going through the motions, it's not going to have the same attention to certain moments. It's not going to be as well thought. So, kind of coaching the pace, making sure that there are you know slower parts and then parts that go more quickly that aren't as important. Where to put the emphasis? Is it a farce? What kind of play is it? If it's a comedy, it needs to be faster, uh, especially if it's a farce. Um, but if it is a drama, there may be moments that need to have those poetic pauses, those pregnant pauses, and let the moment kind of come into its own rather rather than rushing through through it. Um, so it can be intricate, the timing of things, and um, the director is sort of in, in charge of making sure that as the actors come together and create a pace that it needs to be true to the script and true to the writing and um, that it kind of meets the qualifications of the play. And that's a rehearsal, obviously. <laughs> and you can see our, our tape on the floor there. That's another thing that we do in, um, uh, in rehearsal is so that rug on the floor back there, that's meant to represent a staircase before the staircase was built. So as you act it out, you need to be mindful of, okay, now I'm going up a staircase. Uh, the stage manager is the one who tapes the floor there and um, helps keep people aware of the proximity.
it helps the actors know how much space they have to act out their blocking. So on to page 180. Um, as we pointed out earlier with Julie Taymor, there's always a sense of compromise. Always a sense of compromise. So when I costumed this play and I put Carrie in that Catholic school uniform there, um, you know, it may come to the director that the lighting, uh, you know, should be bright red. And it may not look good with my Catholic school girl dress. And so I might ask, can we actually change that to more of a blue so she doesn't look um, so flashy for this time period? And those are the sort of negotiations that you would need to have with the director and the other designers. And in some case, you know, you don't always get everything that you want and some directors can um, push too hard and some designers can be um, too unwavering and it can be difficult to come to conclusions and at the end of the day the director is the one who gets to say I think you need more makeup I think you need less makeup uh, you know compromising with the actors and the designers and making sure that everybody uh, gets along and gets the work done, which is what's fully important. These are called um, technical rehearsals. So we go in from the regular rehearsal into a technical rehearsal. Now this isn't actually a picture of the technical rehearsal because I can see that Richard there has face makeup on and you don't actually put your makeup on until a final dress, dress rehearsal. Technical rehearsals are often just to get the technical cues down. We talked about how important the timing is. So for the people who are working back in the booth to say, okay, this is when the lights need to change. This is when the sound needs to come on. And the actors are running their lines. Those are called technical rehearsals. And those are when a lot of these compromises really come to a head, which is why Julie Taymor was fired right before the show open no doubt because text can be very trying on anyone's um, anyone's patience let alone uh, a perfectionist so trying to kind of bring it all together and put it all together the director needs to make it all um, you know all the design kind of coexist in a way that makes sense needs to work with the actors and make sure that everybody stays relatively happy and headed in the same direction all right. Obviously, the act, as he says in the uh, textbook here, sort of the cruelty of a director is that you do all this work and then you're kind of sitting on the sidelines. You, you have to give it over. And a director's pretty useless after opening night. You don't give any more notes. You're kind of out of the picture. This is The Little Mermaid on Broadway, by the way. This isn't Carrie's War. Um, but a curtain call, you don't see the director up there. The director uh, is on the back row most often and more nervous than the actors in many cases to see how the audience reacts in any given situation. You may have at the beginning uh, of the show, you may have the director be the one to say, please turn off your cell phones, welcome to the play, and that sort of thing. Uh, they may be around, but once again, they're not going to be usually in the production so um, I look forward to directing more plays at Motlow College, and it was a pleasure to work with Jeannie um, Gallant and learn from her and uh, all of the students of Carrie's War and observe that firsthand. So I hope you've learned a little bit from Carrie's War and from the textbook. Um, as always, thank you for listening.